All right, this is Joseph Homburg. It's November 14, 2007. We're in Studio X in Urbana, Illinois. My name is Brent Cochran, and the videographer is Henry Ratcliffe. Okay. Mr. Homburg, what's your date of birth? May 25th, 1914. 1914. And you joined the Army. Were you drafted, or did you enlist? I, I was drafted, You yes. were drafted. How did you... How did you feel about being drafted? Well, um, I, I didn't object. I wasn't one of these conscientious objectors mm -hmm. or anything like that. Uh, I, I was ready uh, to go. The only thing that bothered me was that my wife was five months pregnant. And I would have loved to have been present at his birth which I wasn't able to, and I asked for a deferment of several months, and uh, I was denied, so I accepted that, and I went into the Army uh, in May of 1943. How did your wife handle that? How did she feel about you being drafted? Well, she wasn't very happy, but she accepted it, and she knew that there were millions of other men, a lot of them uh, under the same circumstances as, as I was that uh, uh, went into the service, and she, she accepted it and made the best of it. Where did you live at the time that you were drafted? I lived in Champaign, Illinois. In Champaign? Yes. Um, did you have the opportunity to cho choose which service you were going into, or did they just tell you you were going? No, I, I didn't have that. I didn't volunteer for a particular service, so uh, I had to go wherever they decided. It was at their discretion, and uh, I, I didn't really know uh, when I was, after my... Uh, induction into the Army at Camp Grant, we uh, were put on a train, the destination of, of which we didn't know, and we didn't know. We traveled and traveled uh, all day through the night until the following morning, and uh, we were in Texas, and we were greeted at the station by some officers, and I immediately saw the insignia on their collars, and when I saw the crossed rifles, I knew I was in the infantry. How did you feel about that? Well, <laughs> I was a little surprised, but I accepted it. Uh, you know, after all, the infantry is the, the queen of battles, and, and, and it, it's, uh, it, it's an honor to be a part of the infantry because they did a lot of very important work. Uh, at any rate, uh, I was sent to um, uh, Camp Walters, Texas, just a short distance from Fort Worth. It was the largest infantry replacement training center, IRTC, uh, in the country. I didn't know that at the time, but I found out later. It was divided into different battalions, and uh, um, I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but uh, I accepted it, and uh, uh, you're given a series of tests, and uh, uh, to see uh, what qualifications you had, and they wanted to know what your IQ was, and and uh, they wanted to know uh, uh, some of the other qualifications you might have that you weren't even aware of. And it so happened that uh, one of the tests was listening to a series of sounds followed by a series of other sounds and you were supposed to designate if the second sound was the same or if it was different. 
I had no idea what th th that was for or what it meant, but I was told later on that I scored very high in that, and uh, I was being infantry trained as a rifleman, but my specialty would be radio operator because they immediately said, are you a ham radio operator because you did so well on the test? I said, no. And uh, I was pleased because I thought that would be kind of nice. And it turned out to be nice. So along with my uh, basic training as a rifleman, along with all the other infantry riflemen, I also was trained as a radio operator in learning the, the Morse code and so forth. And they have a special way of teaching. You know, they say there's the right way and the Army way. I'm sure you heard that expression. But I want to tell you, the Army method of teaching I thought was excellent. For example, I never fired a weapon in my life. And when we were given our rifles for the first time and uh, uh, were trained how to use them, were trained about the nomenclature, how to disassemble it and to assemble it, and uh, their, their method of teaching was so good that uh, uh, I think any person, even with a low IQ, would have no trouble learning how to handle a rifle. And um, we got so uh, efficient with that that we took great pride in seeing if we could disassemble it and reassemble it in the dark. And we would do that on our bunks at night, turn the lights out, take the rifle apart, and by touch, you can tell what each, and we had to learn the nomenclature. We could tell by the touch what each piece was and how it was to be assembled into your weapon. And uh, it was miraculous to me. And when it came time to go to the firing range, I had never shot a weapon before in my life. First time I made marksman and, and Several weeks later, we went to the range for a second time, and I made sharpshooter, and I was pretty proud of that. Fortunately, I never had to fire my weapon during my combat experience, and I'm very happy about that. How old were you at the time that you went to basic training? I was 29. How did that affect your basic training experience? Did that? Uh, how did that did, what? How did that affect your basic training experience? Were you treated the same? Were you just another guy? Or oh, I was treated the same. I was in a uh, uh, training company with mostly uh, young men. I would say 18, 19, 20, and uh, the training was pretty regular, rigorous. And uh, I never fell out of a hike, and some of those hikes, marching, was, were pretty tough, going uphill particularly. And uh, never had any trouble uh, going through the uh, uh, infiltration course and so forth, where you had to uh, protect your weapon and crawl on the hot sand, and the sand can get very hot in Texas in the summertime, and crawl under barbed wire, and a live machine gun was firing overhead, and you had to keep your body pretty flat to the ground, so you were really close. And I went through that, and after that it was a, a landing ship trainer exercise, uh, I remember one incident uh, when we had to go up a hill which was pretty steep in full field pack, helmet, rifle, and all of a sudden somebody yells out gas and immediately you have to take your gas mask out and put it on it and continue climbing that tremendously steep hill. 
Well, when we got to the top of that hill, <laughs> everyone was exhausted, just exhausted. We were given a few moments to rest, which we did. And when I got, to, uh, it was a landing ship trainer after that, and we went through that. That wasn't so bad. It was climbing up a rope ladder from uh, a little boat uh, onto a mock ship. But when I got back to the barracks, it was lunchtime, and I, I didn't eat lunch that day. I just had something very, very light. But um, I earned the respect of all these youngsters who a lot of them were uh, college graduates or the students that were in the ASTP. That was a program for students. that We had that here at the University of Illinois. And uh, they started to call me old man. But they respected me. I never once fell out of any forced march or, or any of the uh, exercises that we had to perform. And uh, basic training for an infantryman is pretty, pretty difficult. Absolutely. So I'm proud of that. And uh, I, I think that takes care of that aspect. Now, when you left Texas, did you go to England? Pardon? When you left Texas, where did you go? Uh, I, I was lucky during my training. Uh, af after the 13 week training cycle, uh, then you're at the mercy of the Army and you don't know what's going to happen to you. But it just so happened that on the very last day of our uh, basic training, uh, it was a Saturday, and I usually went with uh, with a buddy of mine. We would go into town, have dinner, go to a movie, and so forth. I suddenly felt sick. I, I, I just I wasn't well. I wasn't myself. And uh, I remember telling my friend uh, as we were walking to the bus, we were going right by the uh, dispensary. If that's where you go on sick call. I said, Harold, you know, I, I really feel pretty tough. I think I'm going to go in and see if they can help me. Well, I went in, and the nurse uh, gave me a, a cursory examination, put a thermometer in my mouth, and uh, took my temperature. She, she said, uh, Soldier, I want you to go back to your barracks and get your toilet articles and so forth. You're going to the hospital. I said, what? She said, so I, they don't tell you what's wrong with you. So uh, I was in the hospital. I found out after again. They gave me a private room with a, uh, a steamer. and So I guessed right away I had pneumonia. And I was in the hospital for about three weeks. At that time, they didn't have the, the technology or the drugs to knock pneumonia out uh, very quickly. At any rate, while I was uh, on my hospital bunk in the ward, our first sergeant and the platoon leader, who was a lieutenant, and the first sergeant, you know, is the fellow with all the stripes and the little diamond in the middle. Uh, came to see me, and uh, I was kind of surprised. They said, Hamburg, we need your signature here. You were on orders to go to Fort Benning, Georgia for advanced infantry training, and you have to be deleted because you're sick. I, I was very happy about that because I knew of other uh, GIs that after basic training that if they were sent to Benning, the next thing was overseas, and that was during the African campaign. And a friend of mine had that experience, and he wound up, I think he was killed on one of the beaches, Battle of Casino or something like that. So uh, as a result of that, I, I, and my training cycle was over, and uh, 
there, there, everyone wasn't shipped out. There were a number of them, and we really didn't have too much to do. We, we would uh, play ball or, uh, or just do a little marching drill just for the fun of it and so mm -hmm. forth. And uh, one day the uh, first sergeant said, Hamburg, how would you like to go to uh, cadre school? I said, what does that involve? And he gave me an idea. I said, no, I think that'd be a good idea. He said, I do too. He said, you get your stuff together and we'll, there's a different part of the camp in the last three weeks and you have training to become uh, an NCO as a, a non-commissioned officer. So I, I really enjoyed that and it was uh, at a time of year when uh, uh, early autumn and the weather was good and uh, when I was through uh, after the three weeks I came back and uh, shortly after that I was promoted to PFC. That's a big thing, you know, when you're just a lowly private and uh, you get the PFC stripe, you take a lot of razzing, but everyone is envious. And uh, the sergeant, when he gave it to me, said, Hamburg, I want you to be sure and have those stripes sewn on. I want you to wear them. I don't want you to put them away. He said, you're a PFC now and you be proud of it, which I did. And uh, uh, still continued, uh, I, I was assigned, as a result of that, I was assigned to the cadre, which uh, I, I was happy about. And uh, I taught radio code, taught the trainees radio code. And uh, uh, after a short time, the first sergeant called me into the order room and said, Hamburg, you've just been promoted to corporal. Well, I was proud of that. I had my stripes sewn on. And uh, this I was there for almost a whole year uh, as a member of the cadre, teaching and so forth. And uh, then I received orders that I was being shipped to uh, the East Coast to a port of embarkation. And I knew that was in preparation of going overseas. Uh, my, uh, in the meantime, I, I left out a very important part of my life. While we were on a field problem during my basic training, we uh, were way out in the wilderness someplace, and there's a, a lot of areas where it's wilderness in Texas. And uh, we were bivouacked because it was a, 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 a training uh, program of different, it took several days. Uh, we uh, pitched our shelter halves and had a, which resulted in a pup tent and two men to a pup tent. And one night, I had just fallen asleep and it was uh, around close to midnight. I see headlights shining right into the opening of the pup tent, and I hear a voice says, "Hamburg." And I said, "Yes, sir." <laughs> He said, front and center, I came out and he said, uh, I knew my wife was just about ready for delivery. So he said, Hamburger, proud father of a bouncing baby boy. I said, wonderful. He said, we're going to allow you to go into camp, get your uniform on, and we'll take you in the Jeep, and you can make a telephone call, which I did. By that time, it was 2 o'clock in the morning. I called my mother-in-law, and she gave me all the particulars, and <laughs> uh, I, I was extremely happy. 
my wife was all right. And my mother-in-law, I said, uh, who does he look like? She said, oh, he's beautiful. <laughs> he's just beautiful. Uh, Uh, was I didn't get to see him until he was four and a half months old when I got my first furlough. He was born in the middle of September, and I got my furlough in January. And uh, it was wonderful to be home again, even for a short time, and to become acquainted with my new son. He was just four and a half months old. And then... Uh, I was lucky after I got my orders to go to the port of embarkation. Uh, I was lucky to get a, another furlough. It was delay en route. Uh, they gave you time between the time you left camp to go to your uh, destination. You had I got a ten-day leave for which I was very happy, and I got to spend that at home. And Stephen had already he was about. Uh, six months old then, and uh, from then on it was a series of going through several camps and then over to uh, England for more training and finally over to France and that's another story. How did that feel when you found out that you were finally going to France? How did I feel? When, when you left England to head to France? How was that well, experience? Well, uh, when I left England to go to France that first time, I, I knew that we were going to the battlefield. I, I knew that right away. We were put on uh, ships, and then when we got off the ships, we were on these uh, landing crafts. And uh, when we got to uh, shore, you know, the ships aren't, allowed to go too close to the shore because of being grounded. So we're out some distance and then the landing craft takes you to the shore. But this this was, I landed at Utah Beach July 14th, 1944 and uh, of course, nobody was firing at us. The beaches had been secured, and, and the uh, Allied forces had been able to penetrate. The, 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 the whole front from east to west was approximately 50 miles, and the area that they uh, occupied was about 15 to 20 miles deep. So there really wasn't a lot of real estate that the Allied forces owned. Could you well, hear? Could you hear the combat going on in the distance, or were you how aware of uh, what was going on? Once in a while, you could hear a few little rumbles. Uh, we were uh, our area. We were right near a, a little town named Isigny, I S I G N Y, and I could never tell how big that town was, nor were we allowed to go in town to visit with the natives. And uh, But I do know that we were bivouacked in an area just right outside of a little park that reminded me a lot of the West Side Park here in Champaign. And uh, Normandy is known for its dairy products and uh, there, there were a lot of dairy products, and I'm, I'm alluding to the fact that Isini really didn't mean very much to me. I did know that we were about 15 miles from St. Lo. That was a pivotal city in Normandy that was the reason that the progress of the Allied troops uh, was being hampered. We, we really couldn't move. They just went 15, 20 miles. And uh, uh, being a pivotal city with uh, uh, control of the roads and so forth, uh, we couldn't move very uh, easily. Um, 
How secure did you feel when you were there? Did you feel like you're in a combat zone, or did you feel like it no, was a garrison? This, this actually, this was in the rear of the combat zone. Mm -hmm. We were maybe 15 or 20 miles away from the real action, and we we went over as free replacements, infantry trained, each with his particular specialty if he had one. And we're just waiting to be assigned. We had no idea where we were going. And uh, we had no duties to perform, so we, we would just maybe play a little ball or uh, oh, one of the very uh, wonderful things was the daily newspaper that the armed services printed called the Stars and Stripes. Well, you were in the service, weren't you? Yes, Are you sir. familiar with that? Yes. Well, when we got that paper, we devoured it from cover to cover because that told us the progress of the war and what was going on. And uh, we were just waiting to be assigned. Uh, I landed there on this July 14th, but I really wasn't assigned to a division until the first week of August. So that was period of a couple of weeks. During that time, were you feeling um, really ready to go, or were you happy that you were well, having some time I, 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 I was preparing myself for any of an eventuality. Uh, I was just hoping that I would be with a good outfit, with a, you know, your buddies would be friendly, and I was hoping that I would be assigned as I knew I'd be signed as a Neptune, but as a radio operator, and luckily I was signed to the Second Infantry Division, uh, Ninth Infantry Regiment, Third Battalion Headquarters, and I got to know the fellows. And they were all really nice guys, and said, "We'll take care of you, Hamburg." And, teach you the ropes and all that, and I felt secure because for such a long time I was attached and unassigned, and now I found a home. When I reported to the uh, company commander, uh, who was a captain, I reported and he said, well, I see Hamburg, I see you're a corporal. He said, our table of orders doesn't call for uh, an NCO with your grade, uh, I said, <laughs> and by that time I had gotten to know the fellas. I said, Captain, you can bust me, but I want to stay here. And he said, well, don't worry about that. And, and I did get to stay as a, a radio operator. And um, so you felt very happy in your new unit? Pardon? You felt very comfortable in your, your new unit? Yes, I did. I, I knew the dangers that existed uh, and uh, uh, these experience, these, uh, these other uh, men in the outfit were pretty well seasoned by that time and they had been in right from the very beginning and they would tell you things and uh, to help you along, and so you, you really began to feel very comfortable. Uh, when when did your unit first move out, move more towards the front lines? When did you first head towards the front lines? That very evening that uh, that I was assigned. That evening, uh, another. Uh, uh, fella in the uh, communications section. I think he was uh, uh, a wireman. That's the telephone. And I was the radio operator. And they handed me an SCR 300, which was a fairly heavy uh, radio, which I had a sling over my back. And I carried my weapon. And he said, Hamburg, we have to go to the command post. And it was dark, and he said, I know where it is. He said, just walk along with me, and uh, if any flares are shot up by the Germans, 
just stand still and be absolutely motionless because you have no idea how bright those flares are. And one did go up shortly after we started out and it just lit up the whole countryside. And uh, we stopped and uh, finally it uh, lost its uh, full power as it was coming down to, to earth and uh, we were able to proceed and, and we finally got to our, uh, uh, it was a little farmhouse and when we entered there was a black cloth hanging in the doorway hiding the light because uh, if you expose too much light you're a target. So uh, I was, uh, they had sort of a, a little excavation, something like a cellar, and uh, I went down there and put the earphones on, and uh, I, I didn't have to do anything, I just listened, and I just heard a lot of, uh, a lot of activity going on that was all radio signals, which I couldn't understand because they were so fast and so many. I had no idea, but I was told to just to listen, monitor, so forth. And that was uh, my first experience in combat. To go back to when the flare was shot, how, how did you feel as you were standing there waiting for the light to go out? Well, I felt exposed. You'd be surprised how bright that was. I just felt exposed. Anyway, uh, when it finally subsided and we were able to go forward, uh, I felt better. On the way to that farmhouse, I encountered my first dead GI, which was uh, a bad experience. But you, you learn to um, harden yourself and uh, accept it. And uh, I... Uh, uh, I want to mention one thing about Isini, uh, that town. Uh, just a, a little sidelight experience. Forty years later, when I took my wife, we were on a, a little trip to Europe and, and went on a sightseeing. We were on the sightseeing bus and we visited the invasion area, and we were on this four-lane, beautiful highway. And I was looking out the window, and all of a sudden I see a good-sized sign that said, Yesini, I-S-I-G-N-Y, yogurt capital of the world. I said, Merle, take a look. This is where I landed. This is where Utah Beach was. And I got real excited. And um, we didn't have time to go into the town. I would like to have seen what it was like. Um, uh, do you, do you remember the first time you saw a German soldier? The first German soldier I saw was a prisoner of war. And uh, I was very happy about that. They, uh, they're human beings. And, and uh, uh, I remember one of them was sort of a wise guy. And he was cursing and and spewing out a lot of venomous rhetoric about General Eisenhower. He said, that guy's causing us all kinds of trouble. <laughs> he could speak a little English, he had that thick German accent. But uh, after that, I saw a lot of German prisoners. And what a delightful feeling you have when you see them marching. You know, uh, Having seen them as prisoners, did that change the way you looked at them as combatants? I didn't hear your question. After, after seeing them up close as prisoners like that and seeing them as people, how did that make you feel about them when it was in a conflict, when well, it was in a combat situation? Uh, they're humans and, and uh, they have feelings and, and uh, uh, they're at the mercy of their uh, government, of the leaders. And uh, they're, they're forced to do what they have to do. Uh, 
that doesn't mean that, uh, that they were sympathetic to the Nazi cause, for example. So I, I, I really didn't have any ill feeling towards them. And I remember when I was on the hospital ship going from Normandy back to England, uh, the, the prisoners of war who were wounded were right alongside all of the GIs. They were given the same treatment. They, they, they were given the, the very same medical treatment. And I want to tell you that the medical department of the Army did a magnificent job. Um, that, that's uh, another story. Was, was there any situation that you felt like um, you were directly being attacked by the enemy? Did you ever have a... a well, uh, we were in Normandy, uh, you know, in action, actually, uh, for several days. And then we were pulled out and put in reserve. And uh, uh, that means you don't see any action. And during that time, uh, the uh, USO and the, uh, the Special Services Department were very, very good about sending entertainers. And right up at the front, Dinah Shore, she, she made an appearance and they, they built the stage and she got up there and was doing her act and singing. And I remember all of the GIs who didn't have chairs, we turned our helmets over and sat on the dome of our helmets with our rifles alongside us. And um, I thought that was great. That's the only entertainer that I, I really got to see. Anyway, after a short time in Normandy, we were told that we were going to another destination and we were put on transport trucks and it was the 2nd Infantry Division, the 29th Infantry Division who fought alongside the 2nd uh, during a good part of the war, and a battalion of rangers. We were ordered to go to the port city of Brest, France, and to capture the city, which was being held by an elite paratroop division that uh, were not used to being defeated. They were a crack outfit. And uh, it was there. Uh, it was the latter part of uh, August. By the time we got, we traveled all night and finally got there uh, early the, the following morning. And uh, we didn't go into the attack mode until later on. And uh, the uh, German forces occupied the city, which uh, they had the high ground. They actually were looking down our throats. And when we attacked, we were at a terrible disadvantage. But at any rate, uh, on the 29th of August, I uh, was digging a foxhole with my buddy. You know, everything in the Army is buddy system. And uh, fortunately, we, the hedgerows uh, offered a, a wonderful shelter from enemy fire. And they varied in size. I remember we were, were uh, uh, dug in behind hedgerows that were maybe uh, two feet high. Sometimes they were three or four feet high. This particular hedgerow was the largest I had ever seen. It was about 10 feet high and about five feet thick. So that was pretty good cover. So my buddy and I were digging our foxholes and the the Germans started to shell. And they had 88 millimeter cannons mounted on tanks. 
which was one of the best weapons in the German army. And uh, it fired a shell about this long and about this big around, had a muzzle velocity of 3,000 feet a second. Now an M1 rifle she, uh, it takes a 30 caliber bullet, which is uh, about this long and maybe about as big as a little finger, it has a muzzle velocity of 2,900 feet a second. So you can imagine when a shell like that it, it is so fast, when you hear the muzzle blast, less than a second later, the shell is there and it has exploded. So what you hear is a boom, boom. The second boom is the explosion. And uh, they started to shell us and uh, fortunately, uh, I was behind a hedgerow and a hit on the other side of the hedgerow and suddenly my left arm went numb. And I thought it was from the concussion and uh, involuntarily I started to shake my arm hoping that it would, the feeling would come back and then my buddy who was digging with me said, hey Hamburg, you're hit. I looked down and he says, he says, you got a hole here and a hole here. And uh, that was the extent of my, I didn't know how serious it was, but I found out later after surgery that they had uh, the, the bullet or the sh shrapnel had broken the ulna bone, compound, com comminuted fracture, injured the median nerve, and uh, my arm was in a cast from here to here uh, with a diagram showing me what, which the, the doctors, anyone that wanted to know what was wrong could see what it was. And uh, when, when you found that, out, when you realized you were wounded, did you feel scared or relieved or? Uh, I was, terribly surprised. I, I, I can't describe my emotion. I, I wasn't relieved. I was worried what's going to happen to me. And right away, after the, 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 when the shelling stopped, the first sergeant always goes around and he hollers out, uh, anybody hit? Anybody hit? And my buddy said, yes, Sergeant Hamburger's hit here. He said, Hamburg, go back to the aid station. And uh, I started back. I didn't know where the aid station was. I had to ask one of the GIs on the way and he gave me some directions and finally I got there. And uh, 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 before that point, had you had any friends wounded at all? What? Were, were any of your friends ever wounded? Before you were, uh, did you experience no, anyone? No, no, no. I, I was the only one in that particular outfit, in that section, in the communication section that was hit. Now, what happened subsequent to that, I have, I have no knowledge. But I, and along with me being wounded was our uh, um, uh, our, our leader who was a uh, first lieutenant. He was struck in the neck, and I remember sitting in the ambulance with him. My first was concern was, Lieutenant, do you think I'll be able to come back with the outfit after I get out of the hospital? I had no idea the extent of my injury. He said, oh, sure. I never saw him after that, nor did I ever get back to my outfit. What was your but, experience in the hospitals and the aid stations? I have nothing but the highest respect for the, the medics, the whole medical department of the Army, all the way from the MASH unit that I went to. Uh, that, that was 
this was before the, the, the MASH movies, so you had no idea what it was like. But after seeing the movie, it was very similar to that. Every tent city, everything in tents, I was put on a gurney, and I had to wait uh, all, all night in terrible pain before I was taken to surgery because they had so many wounded men. And uh, uh, I remember the, the treatment that we got, the efficiency and the uh, attention and the uh, speed with which they did things was really heartwarming and astounding. I remember when I was finally uh, taken into the operating room, also, everything was tense. Uh, and I was in my, still in my uniform with my boots and everything, leggings. And uh, immediately the uh, nurse on one side, she took scissors and cut my sleeve off and lathered my arm and started to shave it. And uh, a doctor on the other side had uh, done the same thing with this arm, t t taken the, cut the sleeve off and so forth. And uh, he had a needle in his hand and uh, he swabbed my the inside of my uh, arm this like this and he said make a fist which I did I said what, what's that needle for he said oh this is the anesthetic <laughs> I said anesthetic I looked I said you gotta be kidding he said oh you think so count count to ten <laughs> I remember as he stuck the needle in I remember saying what I didn't even get to finish saying the number one. And I was out like a light. That was sodium pentothal, and that, that was uh, an anesthetic of shorter duration, and after they put you to sleep, then they give you the uh, heavier dosage of, uh, of uh, anesthetic. So, uh, the next thing I knew, I woke up. It was uh, nine o'clock in the morning. Sun was shining. Birds were singing. I was on a, a, a canvas cot. Uh, first thing I did is look to see if my arm was still there. <laughs> it was in this cast that I mentioned with the diagram of what happened. And, uh, a ward boy came along. I don't think he was more than 17 or 18 years old. And I was wondering what such a young kid was doing in the Army. And he was uh, uh, a, a medic. He, he was like a nurse taking care of patients. And uh, when he saw that I had awakened, he came over and said, how you doing, soldier? I said, OK, I'm, I'm in some pain, which I was for a long time. And uh, I said, I'm hungry. He said, well, we'll, we'll bring you some breakfast, which he eventually did. And uh, he ran his hands over my face, which was, I had a pretty good growth of beard. And he said, uh, you need a uh, shave, soldier. And he, he said, I'll fix you up. And he did. He came back later and shaved me and brought me breakfast. And, and uh, from there on in, it was uh, getting ready to be shipped back to a hospital in England. Uh, shall I continue and go a little further? Do you have any questions? Absolutely. Well, when, I could go on and on and on. Uh, when, when you were in England, uh, what was the experience like that in the, in the hospital? Did you uh, have any contact with your family at that time? or? I was able to write letters. That's the only contact I had. I was sent to uh, 
a general hospital, which is the elite. That's where they have the, all the facilities that you need in any first-class hospital. And I was there for about three months. They performed about three more surgeries on my uh, arm and uh, uh, went through a period of uh, uh, therapy, physical therapy. When they removed the cast, my arm was about this big around. But they said, don't, don't worry, it'll, it'll get back to normal size. And I have the highest respect for the medical department in the Army. They did a magnificent job. And uh, uh, after my stay in the hospital, uh, oh, incidentally, several days after I got to the hospital, um, the executive officer who was uh, a major in full uniform came into our ward and called out the names of four people, of which mine was one of them, and said, gentlemen, I'm happy to award you with your Purple Heart. So uh, we all stood there, and, and of course, this arm was in a cast, and he handed me my Purple Heart, which I took in this hand, then he stood back. <laughs> I couldn't return that salute. But he understood anyway. After that, it was a series of rehabilitation centers and interviews and so forth and so on until uh, uh, I finally wound up uh, with a uh, replacement depot in Verviers, Belgium, who uh, uh, just right about the time when the Battle of the Bulge took place, and we were processing troops going to the front. And uh, I had uh, a job in their uh, classification section, which I was happy about, and we just processed troops going through, and uh, finally, in uh, May the 8th of that year, the war ended, and it was uh, a process of going home through the point system. You were awarded points, and if you reached a certain level of points, you got to go home. and. Uh, my last place of assignment was uh, in Reims, France, at the Champagne capital of the world, at the Little Red Schoolhouse where the peace treaty was signed. And that was quite an experience for me. So you were, were you there when the peace treaty was signed? No, no, it was after. That was afterwards. I got there, I think it was in, uh, uh, oh, maybe September. And uh, uh, I wasn't there very long, and from there on in, when uh, the level of points you needed uh, became uh, 84, I remember I had 84 points, then I was on my way home, so I was uh, uh, relieved to duty there and sent to a, uh, uh, another headquarters, and finally down to Marseille, France, and shipped out and got home. Uh, and uh, separated from the Army at Camp Grant, again, in Illinois, where I was uh, mustered into the Army and uh, got to come home and to see my young son again, who was, at that time, two and a half years old. And that was the first time you'd that seen him? That was a real happy reunion. That's the first time I had seen him in a year and a half. Do, do you remember what you did in your first uh, few weeks home? How you spent that uh, time? Well, uh, visited with family and visited with friends and uh, uh, made preparations to leave the community. We moved to 
uh, Minneapolis, where my in-laws were from, and uh, a whole series of things. And eventually, we, we came back, uh, uh, back to Champaign, and we've been here ever since. What was life like when it returned back to normal for you? Did it Pardon? when it return when life returned to normal when you got back into a normal More or working less, day? More or less, yes. Uh, uh, there were an awful lot of servicemen that that, that had come back, and uh, a lot of them just took up their lives where they had left them and just continued on. Those that were lucky enough to come back. I, uh, in answering your questions, I forgot that I wanted to read this particular thing that I prepared to give uh, people uh, some insight. Uh, this is all re related to D-Day and the, the uh, everything that uh, led up to it and the importance of uh, Anyway, this is what I wrote. It'll just take a couple of minutes. It is important, first of all, to, uh, to recall and to talk about all the preparations and planning that took place prior to the actual invasion by the supreme commanders of this massive invasion army. This fighting force was comprised of three United States divisions, two British divisions, and one Canadian division. It was agreed that the United States General Dwight D. Eisenhower would be the supreme commander of the entire Allied invasion army, consisting of 1,500,000 soldiers, 5,300 ships and boats of all description, plus 2,500 landing craft. In the early morning of June 6, 1944, more than 4,000 ships carried 150,000 American, British, Canadian, and Polish troops across the English Channel to France. In the air, 11,000 fighter planes, bombers, and transports provided support. By the end of the day, 15,000 Allied soldiers would be dead or wounded. This represented the largest amphibious landing in world history. And it was indeed the beginning of the Allied liberation of Europe. The American forces stormed the Normandy coast at Omaha Beach and Utah Beach, the names of which I believe are familiar to all Americans, and the British armies assaulted gold, sword, and sword beaches, and the Canadian forces landed on Juneau Beach. These were all code names of the different areas of invasion. I would like to point out that D-Day took place 63 years ago. A period representing three full three full generations of people. And I am estimating that a good many of them weren't even born or were too young to recall this historic event. And I know it must be difficult for them to grasp the magnitude of this military action. At any rate, the invasion proved to be successful, and by the end of the day, all five beachheads were secured, and by the evening, the uh, enemy was uh, driven back away from the Normandy coast. And 
from that point in, I related my involvement uh, in the war. That's beautiful. Do, do you have anything else you'd like to say about your experience uh, or any, any no, stories in specific? Uh, I can't say enough about the medics. They, they were really wonderful. Just happy to be here. Thank you very much. Great job. I guess that'll be all then? Yes. Is that all? That's it. Some, do other things with it once I edit it. <clears throat>